Hello. In the Norse myths and legends, supernatural women, goddesses, giantesses and valkyrias often appear to teach young men during initiation. Snorri stated that it was Freya who taught the art of Seidr to the Aesir. Uh, and now to teach someone a magical art such as Seidr is to initiate them. An Edda poem also relates how the goddess Freya initiates young Ottar by taking him down into the underworld in which a giantess, Hyndla the she-wolf, teaches him about universal interconnectedness through a science of cider. Um, now, in the Edda poem Groa Galdr, a young man called Svipdag invokes his dead mother, Groa, at her burial mound, so that she may guide him and teach him spell songs. The name Groa is otherwise known to be that of a völva, that means a witch priestess, who heals the god Thor by singing spell songs over his wounds. Now, in the Prose Edda, we also learn about how Thor, who, was, who had vowed to go unprotected and unarmed into the realm of the giants, seeks the aid of the giantess called Gridr, who, after teaching him about the true nature and the weak points of his opponent, lends him her magical wand, her power belt and her iron gloves, so that he may defeat his opponent. Um, in the heroic poems of the Edda, Valkyria brides are responsible for transmitting knowledge, purpose and esoteric teachings to the young men, to guide them in life and to magically protect them in battle. And now to another source which is not the Eddas, the Fören Aldar Sögur, the sagas of old times, written down during the 13th and 14th centuries AD, but claiming to be the legends of really old times. These sagas, a lot of them, repeatedly present the theme of a witch or a giantess who teaches a young man in order so that he can become a warrior. The stories seem to resemble initiation stories told in a fairy tale like manner. Now, in Shalne Singa Saga, the hero, Bui, walks through cold and uninhabited wilderness before he finally knocks on a door leading into a mountain. He's on a quest for a special and magical game board. He meets the mountain king's daughter called Fridr, her name means peace, and she can tell him that many have come to this mountain before him without having shown themselves worthy, and it has been their death. Bui and Frieder enjoys a, enjoy a long erotic adventure together within the mountain during winter. At spring, the maiden assists Bui in his quest for the magical game board, and it is stated that he could not have done it without her help. Now the mountain, especially the inside of a mountain, the cold, the winter and the wilderness are all typical Norse metaphors for death and the underworld, and um, as is the theme of making love to a giantess in the underworld. The game board itself is symbolic of fate, and the story faintly echoes the initiation story of the god Odin's adventure with a giant's daughter inside the mountain of Suttungr. Now, in the saga of Thorstein Geirnefjö, Geirnefjufostra, the hero Thurstein has to win over the giant Söckulfur. Now this name means dark wolf and uh, is a metaphor for dark death. So he has to conquer death before he, and, de and darkness before he can win the love of the giantess called Geirnefja. Her name means spearbeak, which also refers to death in a way like a deadly vulture. Uh, Thorstein is named after her in a manner that shows her role in his upbringing, or indeed in his apprenticeship. He is called Thorstein Geirnefju Fostra, which means that he is fostered by Geirnefja. Uh, in the same saga, another version of the relationship is presented in which Geirnefja brings the wounded warrior Thorstein to her hall. She heals his wounds and take him, teaches, him, teaches him to hunt with bow and arrow. And um, yeah, he loves her until she dies. In the saga of Illugi Gridar Fostra, which means Illugi fost fostered by Grid, the hero Illugi encounters problems at sea as his ship is wrecked against dangerous cliffs. Illugi is picked up on the shore by the giantess maiden Hildr. Uh, her name is Battle, and she is the daughter of the eagle clawed giantess hag called Gridr Truce. Um, it's the same one as uh, 
Thormat. Now Hild, the daughter, treats Ilugi harshly and violently, but Ilugi displays no fear. His courage causes a spell to be lifted from the two women, and they are transformed into beautiful and helpful ladies. They reveal to him that the unfriendly introduction at first was a test that few could pass. Ilugi is called Gridar Fustra after his apprenticeship to the mother giantess within the cave. Now, um, the theme of hostile giantess turned good and helpful is present in several other sagas. In the saga of um, Illugi Tagldarbani, the bane of Tugld, a hostile giantess called Tugld, which means chewing one, which means death, sends mist and storm in order to wreck Illugi's ship. Illugi has to fight the giantess called Hrimgerdr, and her name means frosty enclosure and refers to death by freezing water. And as he wins the battle, it turns out that this was a test too, and by displaying his fearlessness and by conquering frosty death, he also wins the eternal allegiance, guidance and protection of the giantess that he has conquered. Now, in the same saga, Ilogi also frees a princess from captivity among the giants. Now, um, another saga relates how the hero Gunnar wins over the giant is called Fala. That means to bid for your life uh, in a battle uh, and, uh, well, thus wins her allegiance, her help and protection in further battles against trolls. And the hero suddenly conquers the giant as Mana and she swears her eternal allegiance and help. She gives clothes to the hero, magical clothes that may not be penetrated by weapons, and she gives him a sword that cuts through steel and stone. So, um, the theme of, uh, of the healing and protecting giantess is also prominent. In the saga of Halfdan Brönu Fustra, which means Halfdan fostered by Brona, the hero Halfdan encounters the giantess Bo Brona in a giant's cave, a metaphor for death and the underworld. Brona remains a helpful and guiding power in the life of Halfdan. She offers magical gifts, herbs, a protective uh, and warning ring, and a ship. She chooses his bride, she saves him from fire, she saves his sister from being raped and turns up in his dreams in order to remind him of an old oath that he has to stick to. Now in the saga, Halfdan too frees a princess who is the captive of the giants, another repetitive theme. Now, um, um, in the saga of Thorstein Viking Sonar Skellinefjas, <laughs> Well, this saga relates how the hero Thorstein almost drowns, but is saved by a giantess, and her name is Skellinefja. Her name means shouting beak or shouting no nose, which may refer to the high-pitched nasal sound used for performing spell songs known as Galdr. Um, the fact that Thorstein is called Skellinefjas refers to her having ownership over him. Now in the saga, she heals his wounds and Thorstein has to accept marriage to her. Now when he does that, she is still in the shape of a horrible ogress, but the moment he accepts marriage, the giantess is transformed back into the beautiful princess she really is. Um, the same theme, ogress turned princess, appears in Grimr Lodinkina saga, where the hero Grimr lies on the battlefield close to death after having conquered 12 men, when he is saved by the giantess called Geirid. Her name means spear ride, which is of course another metaphor for death, and she heals his wounds. Thorstein has to promise ma marriage with Geirid, who immediately turns into the beautiful princess with whom he was originally engaged. Um, in the saga of Arrow Odd, um, Örvar Odd, the hero Odd, traverses a rocky mountain landscape before he arrives at a violent riverfall. He finds no way to cross over to the other side. Um, the wilderness is a known metaphor for the underworld and close to Hel there is a resounding and terrible river that forms the border between the living and the dead. Now suddenly, a huge eagle, another known metaphor for death, lifts him up and flies up into the mountains with him, placing him in her nest. And Odd has to conquer the hungry eagle chicks, and through cunning, he manages to kill the eagle. That is, conquer death. Uh, he calls on the aid of a giant, giant who can take him across the river of death, where he's taken to the giant's daughter, Hildegun, battle warrior, that means. And... Um, 
Odd remains there through the winter as her lover. She allows him to leave as spring comes, but lets him know that uh, he would never have gotten out of the world of the giants if it had not been for her help. Like in the first case I mentioned, this clearly echoes the initiation story of Odin and Gunnlöd. Um, in the saga of Egil and Osmunder, the heroes set sails until they arrive at the shore of the world of the giants where they go inland. They travel through deserted wilderness and almost starve to death. After several months they see a herd of goats and try to catch one to eat. Just as they are hunting, they are disturbed by a huge female monster who asks in a high-pitched bell-like voice who they are who are trying to steal the goats of the queen. The heroes try to placate the monster, calling her beautiful, and she takes them home to her mother. The mother of the monster is the mighty queen Eaglebeak, who rules over Jotunheimr, the world of the giants. Um, now, the heroes are well received at the house of the two giantesses, and at the dinner table they share each other's life stories. Queen Eaglebeak reveals the existence of two beautiful princesses who are being held captive in the world of the giants, and who are to be married off to the queen's two giant uncles. Now, the queen and her daughter aid the heroes in their effort to trick the giants and save the princesses, who finally become their wives. The queen of the giants heals the hero's wounds, even to the point of restoring the cut-off hand of Egil. Um, well, several more sagas relate the stories of how heroes free princesses from captivity among the giants. And almost all of these sagas relate how the heroes have to overcome cold, trust, ice, solitude in the wilderness and shipwreck before they are either saved by or have to fight giantesses who later promise their eternal help and allegiance. The giantesses are very often associated with eagles, uh, which are metaphors for death. The trials of the heroes do resemble in many respects the typical trials of a shaman initiate. Now, the sagas in which these strange fairy tales occur are very late renderings of the 13th and 14th centuries after Christ, some written even as late as the 15th century. Thus it is problematic to use them as sources to actual pagan religion, even though the writers claim that they were faithfully rendering the oldest ancestral lore. However, the elements of pagan initiation rituals in these stories are so obvious that they clearly represent some oral memory of the real thing. And the dangers, the trials, the encounter with death, the staying on the other side, often literally described as such, and the mysterious female who saves the hero's life, teaches him, helps him, and in many, t many cases becomes his wife or mistress. Now, the home of this giantess is in almost all the cases situated within a mountain or a hill in a stone or a rock dimension. This is important in light of the fact that caves and stone formations did have a religious function in Norse paganism. As burial places and the home of elves, that is souls, spirits and other underworld uh, inhabitants to whom one could sacrifice or pr pray. So the dark tomb-like home of the giantess reveals often a hidden palace filled with brightness and beautiful magical treasures. This basic formula is repeated throughout the Norse myths, testifying to its widespread importance and probable antiquity. Um, according to the rules of Norse poetry, any name or character in a story may and will be a metaphorical disguise for an actual character which is hidden. And um, this, this real character behind the, the name metaphors uh, is known to the listener or reader through his or her attributes and the various meanings of his or her names and their function in the stories. And in the case of these stories, the giantesses seem to represent either human women and or the actual mythical forces of death. And the one possibility does not necessarily exclude the other. A real human priestess of which could very well be representing a mythological character in a ritual setting. And one candidate for the real character behind the 
giantesses here, is the sea giantess Ran, whose name is robbery and refers to her tendency to rob people of their lives, as I've said before. Uh, she and her daughters cause shipwreck and drowning, but are also identifiable as the lights of the gods, according to Snorri. The numerous shipwrecks and near drowning scenes hint to this goddess, these goddesses of the ocean and the waves. Um, another, obviously, is Hel, the giantess of death, who is famous for having two sides to her character, one a fertile maiden on one side and the other side a rotting corpse, hence the very ambiguous nature of the giantesses in the stories. A third possible actual character is Skadi, whose name means fatal injury, and who symbolically hunts with bow and arrow in the Rocky Mountains, enjoying the howling of wolves, another metaphor for death. Uh, she too has a two-sidedness to her. As a wife of Njordr, the god of winds and waves, uh, she actually she spurs her foster son Frey to undertake initiation. And her love relation to the gods staggers her natural wish to devour them all and allows them to keep the bright Eden and her apples of immortality. Of course, the three giantesses of death are probably just various aspects of the same original character, the Lady of the Underworld. Now, in the stories, the giantess also takes on the role of a sort of guardian spirit, if the legends uh, reflect real-life initiation experiences or rituals for young warriors, as I think they do. The giantess may have been represented by a witch who possibly performed a role as a personal priestess to her foster son, offering guidance and spells of protection throughout his life. There is enough evidence that women performed these roles dating back to Iron Age German societies at the very least. Now, at the same time, the giantess may very well have been identifiable as a typical filgia, a follower, a female guardian spirit who was taught to follow a human individual throughout his or her life, and is probably the same figure described by Snorri as a personal norn, a fate goddess who appears at birth and who follows the individual through life spinning his or her fate. Both Snorri and the Prose Edda assert that bad lives are caused by bad fate goddesses. Not bad because they're evil, but bad because they are in a state of coma. They are the daughters of Dvalin, which means hibernation. Now we will talk more about this subject in another video. Now, the theme of young men's apprenticeship with giantesses who might easily represent real life priestesses is so overwhelmingly present in the lore of the Vikings that one has to wonder if this is not actually reflecting real life initiation. Um, in which, witch, <laughs> in which priestesses or witches may have played a part as teachers. And I'm convinced that they do even more so as the much older source of the poetic Edda seems to be telling the same stories of initiation as its main plot. The almost countless stories of heroes trying to save captive princesses, often, um, often sleeping in their captivity, or transform horrible looking ogresses into the beautiful and helpful maidens they really are, seems to me to be reflecting an initiation ritual in which the waking up of one's sleeping fate so as to acquire a powerful divine fate is the real goal. Now, I dedicate this video to the research of Lotte von Mutz, who pointed out the initiation pattern of the sagas and who was the first to compare them. So, bye.